Welcome to this mock hearing exercise organized by the Global Legal Action Network in partnership with Bellingcat and the OSR for Rights Project at Swansea University. This exercise is part of GLOM's Yemen Accountability Project, which has three strands. The first is the development of a litigation strategy that attempts to address the accountability gap for crimes committed in Yemen. The second is the development of a multimedia database of airstrikes causing grave civilian harm. And the third is enrichment of this evidence to increase the likelihood of successful litigation by exploration of the use of technology and digital evidence in criminal proceedings. It is this third category where today's exercise lies. Glan and Bellingcat have partnered in a long running project to design a methodology for the collection and preservation of digital open source information with the aim of increasing the likelihood of this evidence being admitted and given due weight in criminal proceedings. The focus on UK jurisdiction necessarily means that this event is far removed from the conflict in Yemen, but it is just a small, albeit important cog in a much larger machine. Open source information is far from the exclusive domain of investigators working in Western countries. It's of primary interest to many Yemeni investigators, as demonstrated by the work of groups like Yemeni Archive. Indeed, the first people to begin preserving open source information for accountability in the case of the Syrian conflict were Syrians. This project was initiated on the basis of the increasing recognition in the legal community that digital open source information can be a vital addition to traditional forms of evidence, but that there are challenges in utilizing it. There is emerging suggested best practice amongst academics and practitioners, but still insufficient guidance as to how it will actually be treated when it comes before court. All of this is to say that there are clear principles, but that we don't yet know how the use of open source information would play out in reality given all of the unpredictability of trial and the newness of open source information. In other words, we're aiming to put those principles into practice through this exercise. The issue has arisen to a limited extent in the International Criminal Court. However, issues surrounding the admissibility and weight of digital open source information have not yet been fully tested in the courts of England and Wales. We therefore thought that it would be informative to conduct a fictional hearing to explore how an English court might deal with it and to robustly test the methodology that Glan and Bellingcat designed. By doing this, we can better understand any potential risks or weaknesses in relying on open source evidence in litigation, in particular in the English courts, and use that information to anticipate challenges and strengthen the methodology. The exercise is centered around a real video posted by a Yemeni journalist and featuring real people who are experiencing the traumatic events that we see on screen. The use of open source video and all of the accompanying legal arguments presupposes that the creator of the video and the people in it can't be found. In a real prosecution, an attempt would be made to find the creator and have them come to court and authenticate the video. But this is often not possible, which is why the current exercise is important. As such, the poster of the video is not involved in these mock proceedings today. He's also not named because we wanted to leave room for the defense to impugn the source of the video so as to make things realistic. And we didn't want our audience to confuse any fictional criticized source with the real one. Similarly, no attempt has been made by us to find the people that are featured in the video. This mock session today will emulate a real application before the courts of England and Wales to admit a piece of open source evidence from the conflict in Yemen into criminal proceedings, but subject obviously to some constraints such as the allocated time. In a real hearing, this application would run for longer with more detailed cross-examination of witnesses and likely additional witnesses and experts, particularly a defense expert. But we've tried to make this fictitious exercise as realistic as possible to illustrate the kinds of issues that may arise in real proceedings. However, it is important to be clear that this case and this hearing are fictional. Whilst the piece of open source evidence it focuses on, the video, is a real open source video of an airstrike in Yemen, we've pixelated faces to protect the privacy of those it depicts. 
and many other aspects of the case are fictional, including the expert and the defendant, as is today's hearing itself. The piece of evidence we've chosen to use is not presently being considered, and we don't anticipate that it will be central to any real proceedings in the UK or any other jurisdiction we're aware of. Given the fictitious nature of this exercise, I should also emphasize that any decision reached by our judge will have no legal weight in future in any real proceedings brought in any jurisdiction in respect of the conflict in Yemen. As would be the case in real proceedings, the judge will not make a ruling immediately today. She will go away and consider the arguments she has heard in order to reach a decision on whether or not she would admit the evidence. On Tuesday, the 16th of March at 4.45 p.m. UK time, we'll host another webinar at which the judge will hand down her decision as to whether in this case, she would have admitted the evidence or not. So without further ado, I'd now like to introduce our participants. Appearing for the Crown Prosecution Service, seeking to have the evidence admitted, are Helen Malcolm QC and Joshua Curran. Appearing for the defence, opposing the admission of the evidence are Andrew Cayley QC and Shina Amishon. And we are delighted and privileged to have Her Honour Judge Joanna Corner presiding, who has just been elected to serve as a judge of the International Criminal Court. Yes. Um, may, sorry, may sorry. I please your ladyship? I hope you can hear me satisfactorily. Yes, Ms. Malcolm, I can, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Malcolm, just before you begin, um, I think perhaps if we just explained um, to the audience, uh, I understand a very large audience, um, not only in court at the Central Criminal Court, but also watching on uh, video elsewhere. Um, as has already been said, that um, the time constraints limit both the uh, witness examination and cross-examination and the submissions. Uh, this hearing is being held in, as it would in real life, as a voir dire, in fact, before a jury is impaneled, uh, to decide upon the admissibility uh, of the evidence in this case. And um, uh, therefore it is just the judge and counsel. Uh, I, as the judge, um, am grateful to both uh, counsel, uh, both for the prosecution and the defense for their very helpful skeleton arguments and authorities, which I've had a chance to consider in advance of the hearing. Uh, so without further ado, um, Ms. Malcolm. Thank you. Well, as your ladyship knows, I appear in this matter for the Crown, together with my learned junior, Mr. Joshua Kern, my learned friends, Mr. Andrew Cayley of Queen's Council, and Mr. Shinna Anima Sean appear for the defendant, Mr. Al Katani. The case has been listed today, as your ladyship has just said, for a voir dire on the admissibility of a video. Uh, known in the evidence as Exhibit CG2, also known as Video 3. It is the submission of the prosecution that the video is credible, that it's reliable, and that it's admissible. To set the scene, my lady, on the 7th of May of 2018, at about 10.30 in the morning, the office of the presidency in Sana'a, Yemen, was hit by two airstrikes from a plane of the Saudi-led coalition what is known in this context as a double tap, the first strike to cause damage and injury, and the second when rescuers have begun to dig through the rubble, whose aim is to kill and maim the people who are endeavoring to help those wounded in the first strike. In this case, after the first airstrike, people rushed to help the injured. Video three captured that moment <clears throat> in which people who are plainly civilians are offering help. And the video also, in fact, captured the second airstrike. The attacks, as you will see, came out of a clear blue sky. In particular, the second strike was at a time when dust and smoke had cleared and the view was uninterrupted. And both strikes hit the densely populated civilian commercial center of the city. 
there is, the prosecution would say, incontrovertible evidence to the effect that the strikes caused widespread damage to buildings, to streets and to cars in the vicinity in a way that was anything but targeted over an area far wider than just the office of the presidency itself, which was apparently the target. More importantly, those strikes killed at least six people, including a girl aged nine, and caused multiple injuries to dozens of civilians, to innocent passers-by, people with no involvement in or responsibility for the conflict, people going about their ordinary lives. It is the death and injuries to those civilians that are at the heart of the issues between prosecution and defense in this case. The defendant, Mr. al Qatani, was arrested passing through Heathrow on the 15th of June of 2020. He was interviewed by police and originally denied any involvement. But when presented with detailed evidence that he was indeed the pilot, he then admitted carrying out the mission. However, he claimed to police that the attack was at 7 a.m. and not 10.30, that it was not in a civilian area and no civilians were present, that there was no damage to surrounding buildings, <laughs> that there was no harm to civilians, and he claimed that the video is a fake, a piece of sophisticated propaganda. He claims that the Houthi often exaggerate or fabricate civilian casualties. It is therefore common ground between the parties that a coalition airstrike took place on the office of the presidency on the 7th of May. And the disputes are as to the time of the attacks, the damage to the wider area, and above all, as to the presence of civilians and as to Mr. al Qatani's knowledge of their presence prior to the second strike. Your ladyship knows that within the papers, there is footage produced at CG6 created by the defendant's own employers, the Saudi-led coalition, to prove its targeting precision in eliminating specific, often quite small buildings, and even in eliminating specific people. That footage shows the high resolution, high quality sensor technology available to pilots of the coalition. The prosecution relies on that video to show that by the time of the second strike, not only would Mr. al Qatani have been able to see the widespread damage he'd already caused, but more than that, he would actually have been able to see that there were civilians on the ground helping the casualties from the first strike. It's our case that the presence of civilians would have been clearly visible to Mr. al Qatani. In terms of proving his knowledge of the presence of civilians at the time of the second strike, the Crown therefore relies first on the fact that he was bombing the center of a busy city at 10.30 in the morning. Logically, therefore, there were likely to be civilians around. Second, on the fact that he would have seen that his first strike caused widespread damage, and he would have known that inevitably people will have been trying to help the wounded. Thirdly, that the fact, indeed, the hurting of civilians is the purpose of a double tap in the Yemeni context. Uh, and fourthly, the fact that he appears to have had available to him technology of high resolution that would have allowed him to see civilians on the ground. The case turns on the admissibility of video three. That video, if credible and accurate, provides valuable evidence and answers each of the objections of Mr. al Qatani in his interview, because it shows the time of day, it shows the presence of civilians, it shows widespread damage from the first strike. It shows injuries to civilians prior to the second strike. It shows civilians helping those injured people. And it shows that any dust and smoke from the first strike had cleared prior to the second strike, so that there would have been nothing obscuring Mr. al Qatani's view from the cockpit. And finally, it shows the second strike. It therefore, in our submission, passes the first test of admissibility in that it provides what is clearly relevant evidence. The video lasts two minutes and 20 seconds, and it was found by in the investigating agency Bellingcat on Twitter. Beyond saying that the person who posted it is verified as a real person by Twitter, 
we are unable to identify the photographer or indeed photographers. It was uploaded inversely. That's to say that the first part, the first minute and 10 seconds must logically, as you will see, have been taken after the second half. That is because one particular casualty is being helped in the first part, whereas in the second, he is still lying covered in rubble before anybody had got to his assistance. So clearly the second part in fact comes first in time. The video we would submit has been subjected to rigorous analysis in accordance with the draft Berkeley protocol developed for such cases. Using techniques of geolocation to establish place, chronolocation to establish time, and analyzing content and metadata, including comparing it to corroborating evidence, to exclude any manipulation, including the staging or repurposing, including digital alteration or by intentional omission, that's to say editing of the video. It is the opinion of the experts having carried out each of those tests that this video is authentic and unaltered. We will in a moment call two witnesses. First, Elliot Higgins, the founder of the investigation agency Bellingcat, to talk about verification procedures generally. And second, Frank Palmer, an expert instructed by the Crown Prosecution Service to give independent opinion on the reliability of the video. It is our submission that having heard their evidence, the court can be reassured that the video satisfies also the second test of admissibility. That is that it is reliable and therefore admissible as a piece of real evidence and that it would be fair and appropriate in all the circumstances to admit it. Given the depth, the rigor and the objectivity of the analysis of the experts, it's the prosecution's submission that there would be no unfairness in putting it before the jury if necessary with appropriate warnings from your ladyship. First, therefore, I'm going to ask that the short video be played to the court. I should warn your ladyship and indeed those in the public gallery that it contains some distressing scenes. As you watch the video, I would ask you to bear in mind three things in particular. The devastating damage from the first strike, the presence from their clothing of what are clearly civilians in the street prior to the second strike, including, you will see, a woman in traditional dress and a man in a blue business suit. And thirdly, the clear blue sky allowing a pilot to see what he is about to bomb in the second strike. So may I please now ask that the video be played. يا 
الله الله يعمر الله يعمر الله يعمر يا الله هذا عدوان السعودي My lady, if I may call uh, the Crown's first witness in this war, dear Mr. Elliot Higgins. Mr. Higgins, please will you state your full name to the court? It's Elliot Ward Higgins. And it's right to say that you produced a witness statement in this case of two pages. Uh, that's correct. And do you confirm that the contents of that statement are accurate? I do. In your statement, you describe how Bellingcat has developed a process of verifying open source um, intelligence information. And can I ask you some questions about how uh, you've developed this process over the past nine years. Yes. It's right that you have conducted and written about open source investigations since 2012, when you began blogging about the Syrian civil war under the pseudonym Brown Moses. Is that right? That's correct. And is it right that you established Bellingcat in July 2014 as a journalistic organization? Um, that's correct, yes. And could you just briefly describe how you've come to work with lawyers and how you've come to use this work for the purpose of criminal investigation and prosecution. Uh, Mr. Khan, is this in his statement? If so, which paragraph? My lady, it's at paragraph seven. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so um, Bellingcat, when it was founded in July 2014, um, was a small organization. I was the only full-time employee. Um, and we built a community of volunteers and many of those volunteers and myself first worked on the case of Malaysian Airlines uh, Flight 17, which was shot down in eastern Ukraine. Um, within that, we developed new ideas around investigation methodologies, and we eventually were approached by the joint investigation team who were the official investigators of this case. Um, I was interviewed as a witness. I had to detail our investigation, our sources and other information. And that's when we first became aware of the interest of these kinds of investigators in the kind of work we were doing. Over the years, I was then later approached by other organizations and individuals who were building cases around MH17. And we pay, became aware of an uh, issue with how we had initially investigated this, that there was no kind of systematic methodology around investigating or archiving material. So um, we worked with the Global Legal Action Network to examine this issue, how we could actually create a methodology for both archiving and investigation. And um, this is the process that we're now discussing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Higgins. And, and just turning now to those specific um, methodologies that you um, just referred to, could you um, briefly describe uh, the methodologies that you've employed uh, in this case, um, and in particular, uh, the uh, significance of the draft Berkeley protocol on digital open source investigations, and specifically also uh, the methodology followed by your Yemen investigators? So we um, have a protocol um, that we use ourselves. It's based off the um, Berkeley um, draft protocol, which has been developed specifically uh, in relation to international humanitarian law about how to investigate these kind of incidents. We've also used a platform called Hunchly that will, um, as investigators are using that in their browser when they're investigating, it's recording what they're doing step by step. So we are able to produce as much information about the investigation process itself. We've sorry, been sorry, Mr. Keynes, you're, you're going very fast, but um, apologize. <laughs> can you can you just repeat the name of the uh, the database? It sounded like Hunch something. It's Hunchly. It's Hunch.ly. Um, it's a system that is used with a browser such as Chrome that as you're investigating, it is gathering all the information about your investigation, automatically saving web pages so, and collecting it into a case file that we're then able to present in situations like these to show the process. 
Alongside that, when we come across specific um, videos and photographs that we believe will require archiving, we have been working with the organization Monomic to preserve this evidence in a way that's also should be useful these, for these kinds of processes. Um, alongside that, we use our methodology that we've um, developed over the past several years with Bellingcat to investigate these incidents with um, two key elements of that, one of which is geolocation, which is using information visually um, visible or visible in the videos to establish the location the videos were filmed using other reference imagery in particular satellite imagery and chrono location just, sorry mr higgins thank you um if we could just go back just very briefly to to the um to the use that you've um put to the draft berkeley protocol if you could just briefly uh, in a couple of sentences just describe um, the use that you've made of the draft Ber Ber berkeley protocol in this situation um, and then we'll just turn to the to the issues of geolocation and chronolocation as you um, were turning to. So we've used the draft uh, protocol for a uh, basis for developing a methodology around open source investigation with the intent finally for that information to be used in um, court cases based on international humanitarian law. Thank you. And if you turn to paragraphs uh, 13 um, and my ladyship, uh, paragraphs 13 through to 17, of Mr. Higgins's witness statement. Yes. Um, Mr. Higgins, if you could now please tell her ladyship about the process of, of geolocation and its relevance. And if you could please do try and keep your answers as slow and as clear as possible so that the interpreters uh, can follow. So geolocation is the process or techniques of identifying the geolo geographical location of a person, object or event. For the purposes of this investigation, it was, a it was establishing the location of the videos that we were examining. What we do is we examine objects inside the video, buildings, large structures, and then look at the same location, the suspected location, I should say, on satellite imagery and compare what's visible in the satellite imagery, buildings, roads, and other structures with what's visible in the um, original source that we're examining, in this case, the videos. Thank you. And if you could now turn to paragraph 18, my ladyship, um, of Mr. Higgins's statement, and please um, continue to describe the process of chronolocation of open source material and what its relevance may be to this case. So chronolocation is establishing the time that a video or photograph was recorded. Um, what we do there is once we have the geolocation of a video or photograph done, and we have the exact position of the camera. This then allows us to use the shadows cast by objects or even individuals as a kind of sundial, where we can measure the length of the shadow and establish the time, approximate time of day that an image was recorded. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. And my ladyship, now uh, paragraph 19. Um, Mr. Higgins, what checks uh, can be made on the internal and external consistency of the digital material which you gather? And what checks can and do you make on it uh, to data? So when we examine a video, we have to consider that it might be staged or repurposed. That says, you know, for example, the uh, circumstances around the video have been faked or the video is actually from a different load time or location. We also need to make sure there's been no obvious digital alteration and that there has been no uh, parts of the video omitted that might mislead the viewer as to its content. Is it, sorry, can I just ask, is this something you... Thank you, talking? Mr. Higgins. Sorry, my ladyship. No, that's right. Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Higgins, just so we understand. Um, when, you, when you're talking about what you do, the checks you do, is that you personally or do you get other people to do it? Um, in this case, this would have been the researchers who are examining the videos. Thank you. Thank you, my ladyship. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. If you uh, wait there, um, my learned friend may have some more questions for you because... Uh, those are all my questions for the Crown. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Cayley. Um, Hi, uh, Ladyship. Mr. Anna Michelle will be cross examined. Oh, right. Yes, Thank very well. Thank you, Mr. Anna Michelle. Um, Mr. Higgins, can you hear me? I can. Okay, I've got a few questions for you on behalf of the defence. Um, if I say anything that's unclear, if my, any of my questions um, come out confused, that's my fault. I will take no offence if you interrupt me. 
But what I would be grateful for is that when I ask the questions, you can just confine your answer to the specific question, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, so the first things I wanna discuss with you is, um, I wanna discuss with you on page seven of your witness statement. Can you see it? Uh, could you give me the section? Yes, page seven, and it's when you start, it's a table where you insert yes. um, issues that would be relevant to the video we've just seen. Um, I see that, yes. As video three. Now, in that section, can you do me a favor and please just read out what you, define as an issue for emissions. This is where the reliability of the video is affected by parts of the scene which are omitted. For example, a military base beside the office that was not filmed because the creator was filming the site for propaganda purposes. Such content is authentic but unreliable depending on what is being a, a boost, is that correct? To approve, I think that's a misspelling. That's, that's totally fine. Um, now, do you agree that um, you know nothing about the creator of this video? Uh, not beyond, um, well, no, because we only know where it was posted online on Twitter. Okay. And you agree that it's possible that this video has been filmed by possibly an individual or an entity that's tied to the um, Houthi movement, Houthi movement? Uh, it is possible, yes. Um, and you agree that it's possible that certain favorable information to um, the coalition, as you would describe it, um, may have been edited or not filmed in video three. Uh, that's correct, yes. Okay. Now- can you, can you, Sorry, could you say that again? Yes. Um, do you agree that it's possible that certain favorable information to the coalition may have been edited or not filmed? That's, cor yeah, that's correct. Uh, as I state in my statement, the video is not being offered to claim that there are no military personnel present. Of course. Um, now, I just want to talk to you now about the research methodology um, labelled as research process methodology, um, and that's your exhibit EH1 um, um, that you've just been describing um, in um, evidence with Mr. Cohn. Yeah? Yes. Have you got that in front of you? I do. Okay. Now, um, I, th I think you've raised it, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that was created in um, by Bellingcat. Uh, with the Global Legal Action Network's assistance. Yes. And, um, and that's with assistance of lawyers, I believe, in, in from um, the Global Legal Action Network. Correct? That's correct. Um, and you also referred to um, some assistance from Hunchley. Um, that was in the actual process of actually doc recording the um, investigations rather than the, so it was really a technical um, part, which you can see described near the top of the process methodology. That's fine, thank you. Now it's right to say then that um, in the preparation of this document, you didn't seek the assistance of, for example, military weapons analysis, analysts, did you? Uh, no, I, I believe we did not. Yeah. And it's right also to say that you did not seek the assistance of um, technological um, um, experts in satellite imagery software when you developed this um, research methodology. Um, could you be specific about the kind of satellite imagery software you're re re um, referring to? Okay, so actually that's, rather than talking about a specific piece of software, did you have the assistance of a satellite imagery um, tech expert in drafting this um, report, this uh, methodology? I mean, I, I, I think that's a rather wide question because in our own work, we have extensively used satellite imagery for investigation. So I would consider ourselves experts in that particular area. And depending on what you're defining as tech, I mean, what do you mean by tech would be my question. I okay. apologize for asking questions, but I can't really give a clear answer without understanding that. Okay, so how about this? Um, this this, um, this uh, methodology um, is about to say it was created in the run up to a hackathon. Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. Sorry, what, what was um, in the run up to the hackathon. So, uh, forgive me, my uh, my lady, I, I couldn't hear. You. 
I'm sorry, what was created in the run up to a hackathon? The, e the exhibit EH1. Oh, EH1, I'm sorry, yeah, okay. So part of the purpose of creating it was actually um, specifically for um, this hackathon where it will be tested. Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, and it's a very short document, isn't it? It's um, possibly, I believe, just under 10 pages. Um, I guess you could call it sh 10 pages short, yes. Yeah. Um, now, I want to talk to you about the Berkeley Protocol. Okay. okay. If, if it's possible, can we um, put the Berkeley um, Protocol at page um, Roman numeral um, five? Thank you. Now, um, no, just a moment. Um, uh, I'm afraid I've got to get there too. Of course, yeah, forgive me. Uh, when you say Roman numeral five, um, hopefully, um, uh, what's it heading? You can also on the um, shared on the screen, and I'll read the relevant section as well. But, um, it, well, no, no, just a moment. What's the heading on the page, the top of the page? Yes, if we can just scroll to the heading, please, so my um, we can all see that. It's oh, uh, full. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And I'll read the section for you, and I just want to um, see how you respond to each of the sections I refer to, um, Mr Higgins, okay? Um, in the forward, it says, since, um, since the, um, then, it says, Human Rights Centre has convened a series of interdisciplinary workshops in collaboration with a range of technical, legal, and methodolog um, methodological experts, including from the OHCHR to brainstorm to develop new tools and to identify and distill criteria, standards, methods of uncovering, assessing and verifying and preserving digital open um, 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 source information. Now you agree that there's value obviously in an interdisciplinary approach in preparing research methodology. Yes. Yes? Yes. Thank you. If we could now go to page 11, please, of the same document. Um, my lady, first assistant, so um, this is to, um, the section that deals with principles um, applied yeah. when conducting um, these investigations. And specifically, um, I, will, I go to what is referred to as paragraph, um, section three, objectivity, the objectivity principle, and um, it's paragraph 27. Of Thank that. you very much. Yes, I've got that. Um, and as you can see there, um, I read the section where it says, objectivity is a, f um, is a foundational principle that applies to all investigations, whether online or offline. Um, open source investigators should understand the potential for personal, cultural, and structural biases to aff and that affect their work and the need to take countermeasures to ensure objectivity. I then just um, scroll just a bit past that to open source investigators must ensure that they approach their investigations objectively, developing and deploying multiple working hypotheses and not favoring any particular theory to explain their cases, yeah? <laughs> and, um, I just want to raise to you, do you agree that objectivity being a fundamental requirement of investigation? You may not disagree with me on that. Yeah, I agree with that. And do you agree that um, the methods of investigation should be free from bias? I agree. And you agree um, that there's a potential in, um, in, in, in conducting research for there to be what can be described as, do you understand what expectation bias is? Uh, yes, I do. Can you please explain that for us? So it's um, well, simply creating an expectation of what you think you will find in the investigation or whether or not you have a preconception of what you think this investigation shows and then building the investigation around those preconceptions, either consciously or unconsciously. Thank you. Um, now, and obviously you agree that that's something that should be avoided in any methodology. Indeed. Thank you. All right. If we can now go to page 13. Um, my lady, um, this is to do with 
the methodology and uh, methodological principles. I've got that. Um, Thank you. Yes, and this section's accuracy. Yes. Um, and I read here, there is a, a methodological and ethical imperative to ensure the accuracy and thus the quality of investigations by only relying on credible materials. Um, and then it goes, accuracy is often improved through the use of testing of um, multiple working hypothesis and or peer review, both of which can minimize the chances of bias selection, interpretation and presentation of data. Um, and you would agree that um, peer review, the peer review process could minimize such things as raised in that paragraph. Indeed, yes. Um, and it would assist in identifying weaknesses and analysis um, that a fellow investigator has carried out. Indeed. Okay, so if we could, thank you for this, if you can just take this off the screen. Now, um, in terms of Bellencat, I just want to talk to you about um, um, your organisation. Um, it's right to say that um, you, you describe yourself as an open um, source analyst, don't you? I think that would be a fair, yeah, I think that would be a fair description of myself, okay. yes. Thank you. And in fact, that's what you, you're labelled as, as your occupation and your witness statement. Yes. And um, it's right to say that you've not been designated by any independent regulatory body as such a role. Uh, that's correct, yes. And neither um, has any of the investigators who are underneath your, um, um, who are delegated underneath um, Bellingham. Um, that's correct. I mean, you might be able to explain some of the names of those organisations for the court, maybe. Okay, no, um, I'm just focusing on those who work in Bellingcat. Okay, no. Um, and it's right to say that Bellingcat as a body is not um, regulated by any independent body. Um, as far as I am aware, well, we are regulated by um, Impress, the UK press regulator for accuracy and the other things that they cover. Yes, we are regulated by them. But in your role as, as you describe, open source analyst, you're not? Uh, <laughs> well, in the fact that in, that information is published on our website, which is regulated by Impress, and we okay. would be regulated if we made any you know, errors there. Um, and But that doesn't cover, for example, criminal investigations? Uh, no. And there's no... Um, there's not a contractual registry duty on the Bellingcat to follow the um, Berkeley Protocol, is there? Uh, there's not, no. And um, there's no duty upon Bellingcat or any of the um, volunteers um, or yourself to use um, any of the um, software you've already described. There's no what? Sorry, I didn't quite follow that. Okay, Sorry. maybe I'll keep it quite short. Um, there's no um, there's no duty upon you to use any particular um technology as part of your research process, is there? Any particular technology? Um, I, I think to be clear there, much of this technology, um, we don't deal with just one technology. So we use a broad range of tools and techniques and technologies in our research process. Yeah. So to say that, that I, that's a difficult one to answer, but just so that's it's fine. clear. But what I'm saying is that you, you have a freedom of choice of what you would use and there's no industry strand, standard essentially um, on you using any, any, any of the software you've identified. I mean, there's no industry standard that I'm aware of in our particular form of investigation. Okay, thank you. Now, um, in talking about um, your methodologies, um, you talked about the research process me methodology we've been describing as EH1, that it was based on um, the Berkeley um, draft protocol. protocol. Uh, yes. And um, in fact, you said, um, as I quote, we use this um, draft as the basis. That's what you said in evidence. Now, it's right to say there's nowhere in that research process methodology do you actually refer to the Berkeley protocol, do you? Uh, no. And nowhere in your statement do you actually say that that's the basis on, on which your, um, your methodology was created? I would have to review my statement um, to confirm that. Okay. Um, if you maybe just take it from me that, that you haven't made that connection um, at all or say okay. that in your statement. Now, I just want to refer you to um, page six of your witness statement, and I'll take you 
Which paragraph? That's easier, I think. Mm. Yes. Um, the paragraph with the heading parties to the conflict. Yes. Um, and can you just read out that paragraph for us, please? Um, I'm afraid it's partly obscured by the, um, unfortunately, everyone's uh, windows. Um, that's totally fine. I'm happy to read it if that's okay. Yeah, that's, that's fine. I apologise. I can't read the entire thing. No, that's totally fine. When um, parties to the conflict, when referring to air power amongst mm. parties to the conflict in the Yemen, um, um, in Yemen on instant assessments, be aware that only the Saudi-led coalition and their allies have access to conventional air power capabilities, such as jets and mail drones. The um, Houthis have access to a wide range of surface um, to air missiles, ballistic missiles, short range, UAVs, as, uh, and as of 2019, long range UAVs. Now, if we then go to um, page eight, and I'm gonna read under- I'm really sorry, I am really sorry, and I'm sure it's me, but I can't see this anywhere in the copy of the statement I've got. Are you saying this is Mr. Higgins? Oh, forgive me. Um, this is the research methodology process EH1 um, exhibited to the statement. I see. I'm really sorry because you referred to his statement. Oh, sorry. Um, and, sorry. And you're still referring to EH1. Fine. That's fine. No. Right. Um, and um, if we now go to page eight of um, EH1, um, you make a similar statement um, um, under the instant grading section only the coalition has the capacity to carry out airstrikes and therefore a conclusion that an um, instant was an airstrike is almost always a conclusion that the coalition was responsible. Um, I just wanna refresh your mind to the fact that during evidence just moments ago, when I talked about the principle of objectivity, um, you agreed with that and how that should be taken into consideration um, um, as a starting, I guess, as a starting point. Um, and you said um, creating this, you should avoid preconceptions of what um, research shows, building around the investigation um, cautiously. Now, you would you agree with me that that statement in the research process methodology is starting with a hypothesis that is biased? Well, I mean, it's rather like if you said um, someone has been shot and there's a bullet in them and you had two suspects and one had a gun in their hand and one had a knife, you could probably figure out who the suspect was. Um, it's really based off, um, you know, a knowledge of the conflict. Mm -hmm. So to claim that the Houthis do have access to aircraft that could carry out these airstrikes is not based on any evidence or fact that I think anyone could, you know, that I'm aware of, certainly. Okay. Now, um, okay. Then let's, let's focus on this then. You said this was based on the Berkeley Protocol, correct? Uh, yes. Anywhere in the Berkeley Protocol, um, have they used, and obviously I appreciate that um, it's quite a big document, um, over 100 pages, um, references to a particular um, attack as a basis for um, an, an um, research process? Well, whilst it was a basis of what we were doing, this also took in consideration the unique circumstances surrounding the conflict in Yemen. Uh, including the weapons available to each party in the conflict. So whilst there was a basis of that in the Berkeley Protocol, um, it also was based on a understanding of the conflict, what uh, each faction had access to in regards to weaponry. Okay, now how about this then? Do you agree that whether a particular side of um, a conflict has any particular weapon is a variable that can change at any time? Well, I mean, in reality, not really. I mean, if you're talking about aircraft such as jet fighters, uh, bombers, those that can carry out airstrikes, it's not really something where you just all of a sudden one side has it or they don't. They require okay. support, they require arming, they require refueling. Um, so it's not simply if you just say they suddenly have them, you would need, I think, really to be able to evidence that claim somehow. OK, so if we then go back to your page six under the heading that I just described, parties to the conflict, um, your last sentence says, as of 2019, long range UAVs. So there's a temporal element in your, your assertion that you've made already that this is something that's dependent on time. Is that correct? Well, the other thing to consider with UAVs is their possible payload and the amount of damage they could actually cause. So um, Mr. Higgins, that's not the question I'm asking you. I'm asking you specifically, 
Is there a temporal element that you've attached in there? It's quite obvious, it says 2019, you agree? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? In the last sentence of that paragraph, you add that a variable, um, the variable of whether who has a UAV is that, it, that is the situation as of 2019, correct? Correct, yeah. Thank you. Um, next, I want to talk to you about um, software that you identify in the research process methodology. Um, in there, you identify, for example, that as part of a process, you would use publicly available software. Is that correct? Oh, that's correct, yes. Where's that, please? One moment. Sorry. Um, All right, well, don't worry, you can give me the reference later. That's not yes, ma ma sorry, it's not um, allowing me to search. Google Essentially, Earth. you use Google um, Maps Pro. For Google example. Earth Pro. Google Earth and Pro, thank yep. you. And um, is that the only program your investigators use for satellite imagery, or would, can they use other software as well? Um, I mean, there's other platforms where you can get it. For example, um, Terra Server was a source of that. It's possible to order satellite imagery, of course, directly from the providers as well. And they have their own platform for browsing satellite imagery. Okay. Now, um, by the example of Google Earth Pro, um, is it right to say that um, you, Bellingcat, doesn't have a professional relationship with the makers of Google Earth Pro? I mean, I do know the makers of Google Earth Pro, yes. And, uh, you know, the, we have worked on, with Google and, yeah. So it, it depends what you define by the makers of Google Earth Pro. Do you mean That's specific it. technicians or, or Google? Right. If they, friend no, what is, sorry, no, 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 let's go back one step. Yeah. What do you mean by professional relationship? Do you mean a contract? Yeah. Um, okay, so we can clarify. Um, thank you, my lady. Do you have a contract with um, um, Google? Uh, no, we don't have any contracts with Google. Um, would they ever provide you with information from their servers? Uh, Have they provided the, you with the, This is a complex, I mean, Google is a huge company with many different services that we use in a variety of different ways. And if you're saying, would they provide us of information from the servers, are you referring to information that would otherwise not be supplied to the public? Because of yes. course, we're all being served. Okay. Um, in very specific circumstances, but not in relation to um, this specific case, I would say. Thank you. Now, um, if there had been a system issue or system failure with um, using Google Earth Pro during this investigation, that wouldn't have been recorded by um, Hunchley, would it? Well, for one thing to understand about Google Earth Pro and the limitation of Hunchly is that it works on Chrome, which is a browser. Google Earth Pro is actually a separate um, application or software. Okay. So it would be unable to even record that um, access through Chrome to Google, um, Google Earth Pro because it's a separate application. There's no duty within your research methodology um, for the investigator to record information about system failures on the day when they're um, using the software, is there? Um, there's not, no. Okay. So if we were looking at that information today from the investigation, we wouldn't know if there were any system failures um, relating to the research conducted on that day? Um, no. Okay. And at the, um, nowhere in your research process methodology does it set out ethical principles for um, your investigators to follow, does it? Um, no. Such, um, such as? <laughs> oh, such as any of the ones we've just looked at in the Berkeley Protocol that you said was the basis for this. I see. Uh, I mean, we did have an interest, uh, a separate briefing about international humanitarian law, but no, that's not I, part of the protocol itself. Yeah. Thank you. And um, nowhere in your research methodology process do you um, refer to um, um, a mandatory peer review um, process, do you? Uh, no, we don't. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna just size brief frozen for a second. Um, um, I have no further questions for you. If you can just wait there, um, um, maybe ask further questions. Thank you. Thank yes, you, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, my ladyship. 
Uh, Mr. Higgins, my learned friend asked you uh, some questions about um, whether there may be emissions uh, from video three, and if we can exclude the possibility that um, military targets besides um, the ostensible uh, target of the Office of the Presidency in Sana uh, may be omitted from the video. Um, at paragraph 20 of your witness statement, you state that video three is a genuine depiction of the damage to the street, the second explosion, weather conditions and the presence of civilians in the vicinity. Is that right? That's correct. My question, Mr. Higgins, is this. If there were military targets in the vicinity of the Office of the Presidency, which cannot be seen on this video, how does that, in your view, impact upon the reliability of the evidence with respect to the extent of the damage caused, the fact of the second explosion, the weather conditions, and the presence of civilians? It has no impact whatsoever. Thank you. Sorry, what, Mr. Kern, what has no impact? Uh, the presence of military targets in the vicinity oh, right. of the office of the presidency, my lady. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, which may or may not have been omitted from the video has no impact in the witness's view uh, yeah. on the reliability of the evidence as to the matters which it does go to. Yes, no, I think you made that clear. Thank you. Um, Mr. Higgins, uh, my learned friend suggested uh, that an interdisciplinary approach uh, can and should be adopted with respect to uh, testing the reliability of open source intelligence. Um, my question is, is whether it's the case that one does need to have a specific qualification of any type to perform this kind of open source investigation work, or whether this is the kind of work that one can be trained to do on the job, as it were. Um, it's one you can be trained to do on the job. Um, I mean, we've had many examples where even uh, keen amateurs who have done this work have um, done investigations that have resulted in convictions in courts uh, across the world. So you do not need a specific qualification to do this kind of work. Thank you. And does the methodology uh, remain the same, irrespective of whoever is conducting uh, the open source investigation? Uh, it does, yes. Thank you. My learned friend uh, finally asked you about um, Bellingcat's uh, research methodology. Uh, and my final question is a simple one. Isn't the Barclay Protocol precisely an attempt to create an objective, uh, properly regulated industry standard uh, for open source intelligence gathering? That's correct. <laughs> a touch leading, Mr. Kern, but... <laughs> Thank you, my lady. I have no further questions for, for Mr. Higgins. Yes, um, Mr. Higgins, can I just ask you this? Could you turn, please, to your actual statement? Under paragraph 19, you set out uh, your the boxes that relate to the reliability issue. Um, and one of them is headed digi digital alteration. Yes. And you say the video has been cross-referenced with other online material and is consistent with that content. Are you able to say what that other online material was? Um, it would be, um, I would have to, to be honest, look at the report, but it would include things such as the satellite imagery that's available online, other videos and photographs that show details um, that would match between the two videos that would show that they were showing the same scene and specific details were unaltered. Sorry, so uh, other satellite imagery available online and other photographs? Uh, video, you know, other videos and images from the scene. Do you mean the scene at the time or after the attack or just generally? Um, I would say just generally in this case, yes. Um, and the second thing that you say um, under the alteration part is that it is not a realistic prospect that a video this chaotic and short would have been fabricated if someone wanted to create a fake video to implicate the Saudi-led coalition 
in a war crime, it would be very unlikely to take this form. On, on what do you base that statement? Um, I mean, I have been examining conflict videos since 2011, literally, you know, during the conflict in Syria, I'd watch dozens of these videos every single day showing all kinds of activity and airstrikes. Um, the level of um, fabrication, the complexity that would be involved to fake a video like this, for example, would be, in my experience, immense. Yeah, you know, if they've been examining since 2011, can you give us a rough idea of how many um, of these types of, of, of conflict related videos you think you've examined over the, over this period? Uh, the time? Um, to, I, mean, I, I couldn't give a figure, but I would expect it would be in its the high thousands. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you. Yes, Ms. Malcolm. My lady, given the time constraints, uh, I won't take them to you now, but may I ask for your ladyship's note uh, that you uh, uh, note the CG3, 4 and 5, which are the corroborative videos, uh, one of which is uh, going to form particular importance because it is a contemporaneous post on Twitter timed at 10.44 on the morning of the 7th of May, uh, showing the smoke rising from an explosion in Sana'a and saying this is going on quote unquote now. Uh, so that's part of the evidence that I suspect uh, Mr Higgins was referring to. Yes, I see, but I was because he doesn't actually specifically um, relate. Indeed. So, uh, sorry, that CGs three, four, and five. Yes. Are contemporaneous posts on Twitter. Okay. Sure. Well, uh, one, one in particular is contemporaneous, actually, literally at the time of the explosion, but uh, others are immediately afterwards and show the damage of the area. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lady, may I call the second witness, please, Frank Palmer. And I'm going to assume that he's been sworn. Yes. Thank Certainly. you. Uh, Mr. Palmer, you've produced a witness statement, I think, on behalf of the prosecution. Uh, first of all, do you confirm that the contents of it are true? Um, yes, I believe this video is a credible and accurate representation uh, of this alleged airstrike uh, on the Office of the Presidency. Yes. Thank you. Um, in view of the time, and with permission from a learned friend, Mr. Cayley, I'm going to lead you through various bits of your statement. So starting, please, at page one, mm -hmm. is it right that you have been, since 2018, a full-time senior investigator and analyst at a company called OSINT Reports, which I believe stands for Open Source Intelligence Reports? Uh, yes, that is correct. And for two years prior to that, 2016 to 2018, you were a volunteer in the investigative team with that company. That is also correct. You were also, between 2016 and 2018, a cyber threat intelligence analyst for another company called Digital Shadows. That is correct, yep. Uh, again, a company specialising in the use of open source information to identify and assess threats. Uh, that is correct, although I'd stress that the uh, context is slightly different from this. Indeed. Oh, this matter. Indeed. Uh, you have conducted investigations for more than five years in a number of settings, including as a consultant for National Police Forces and for United Nations investigative mechanisms. Correct. And you have more generally a background in the military, including three years as a regular infantry officer and four years as a reservist. That is correct, yes, with an operational tour of Afghanistan as well. Thank you. So presumably in the course of the operational tour and in the course of training, you have acquired familiarity with the effect of explosives. Uh, I am, as an infantry officer, uh, certainly with the effects of small arms. Um, I also have a background as a class three combat engineer. Uh, and so I have been or received some training in the use of demolitions, explosives and their effects. Thank you. And finally, I think I'm right in saying that you have a master's in conflict security and development from King's College London. 
Correct. Is there any part of that master's degree that involves looking at open source or web-based material? Uh, yes. Uh, one of the modules that I uh, completed as part of that master's uh, focused on the use of open source intelligence. Sorry, you, I, I, I'm afraid that you broke up that. Uh, one of the modules did what? One of the modules on my master's uh, was focused on the use of open source intelligence. Thank you. Um, you were instructed, I think, and I'm looking at page two of your statement, mm -hmm. by the Crown Prosecution Service to prepare a report on video three and specifically to assess the location and time at which it was filmed and to assess its authenticity. Correct. Uh, did you, in order to carry out that task, use chronolocation, geolocation, and cross-referencing with other forms of corroborative evidence? I did, yes. Before you carried out that investigation, were you informed as to the time and place at which it was thought the video had been taken, or was it left entirely to you? Uh, I was informed of the rough dates that may have taken place. However, uh, the geolocation and the exact current location are uh, details that I established myself. So it, it was not the case that somebody came to you and said, Mr. Palmer, we think something happened at 10.30 by the Office of the Presidency, please confirm. Those no. were matters that you identified, so to speak, on your own. Correct, yes. Thank you. Uh, and this was a video that was uploaded on the 7th of May of 2018, so on the day that it took place, at about 7.45 p.m. local time. Uh, I believe 7.45 uh, UK time, but yes, correct. Well, your statement says local time, that's why uh, I took it as that. In that case, I'll refer to my statement. For first page of your statement, it says 7.45 local time. In that Is case, that, I'd, I'd re refer to my statement. Like you'd be correct. Thank you. Um, may I take you then to paragraph 15 of the statement, mm -hmm. uh, which is on page eight thereof. Yep. And you identify that there are two parts to the video for the obvious and logical reason that a casualty scene being helped up at the very start of the video appears to be the same person as uh, the one who is lying inert and under rubble in the second half of the video. Yes, correct. Uh, are you able to say whether the two parts of the video were photographed by one person or two? Uh, I'm not able to say that with certainty. Um, However, the fact they've been included or the two videos have been included together suggests that is a, a possibility, um, but I can't say that with certainty. And when you say included together, where do you mean that they've been included? Uh, so two pieces of footage in a single video. So you mean they've been, you mean they've been spliced together by somebody? Yes, correct. And uploaded together? Yes, correct. Uh, now, taking your statement at paragraph 16 and onwards, uh, were you able, by looking at the shadows on the video, to identify what time you think that this was taken? Uh, yes, I was. Um, would you like me to elaborate? Uh, well, could you take us, uh, go, go to paragraph 21, perhaps? Understood. Um, so would you like me to elaborate on paragraph 21 and further on? Please. Um, so as the sun moves through the sky, uh, obviously the length of our shadows change. Um, therefore, you can establish uh, or establish the time by using the proportional height of the shadow compared to the object that is casting it. Um, so as well as, for example, using a, a person as a sundial, so looking at the angle of shadow, you can compare the proportionate length of the shadow versus the object casting it. And that can give a rough uh, time window. Um, within the analysis, uh, we, in order to mitigate for the effects of, say, for example, uh, a type of lens distorting the view of the shadow, 
um, or the fact that the, the ground is covered in rubble and so therefore it's difficult to establish the exact length of the shadow. Um, we carried out this calculation, I believe, eight times, if I recall correctly. Um, yes. That resulted in a mean time of 10.33. Uh, and I am confident that that is within the extremes of what the time may be, um, because if you change the time from 10.33, either 30 minutes before or 30 minutes after, the shadow either comes uh, too long or too short to be consistent with the shadow that you see in the video. And is it right then that the range of times you obtained on your eight checks were between 10.24 in the morning and 10.48 in the morning? That is correct, yes. So taking the mean of that, you ended up with 10.33? Yes, correct. And were you also able to double check against an entirely separate tweet posted at 10.44 local time, which said that there was a strike happening, quote unquote, now in Sana'a? Yes, that's correct. Um, that was not uh, the only example. There were multiple other examples. Um, that one was identified because it was so clear. I'm sorry, you dropped your voice because it was so... Uh, so clear. So clear. Yeah. Yes. So one or other strike must have been no later than 10.44 local time. Yes, correct. Uh, can I now move you to paragraph 24 and following? Mm -hmm. uh, it is not in fact disputed by the coalition that there was a strike on the office of, pres of the presidency, but were you by means of uh, looking at the buildings in the video and cross-referring them to buildings in satellite imagery, in particular one modern building with very um, identifiable windows, able to satisfy yourself as to the location? Yes, I would add, however, that the Saudi coalition stated they have bombed the presidential palace, um, hence why this geolocation is, is relevant, uh, because it shows that the strike took place on the, uh, what's referred to as the office of the presidency. You, you're quite right, I was going to come to that. Uh, yeah. The palace is a separate building and elsewhere in the city, is that right? Correct. And you have also checked uh, over a period of some months uh, photographs, satellite images of the palace. And does it show any damage at all between, I think it's February and uh, October, if I remember rightly, of that year? Uh, so at this point in the conflict, the presidential palace had already sustained significant damage. Um, I beg your pardon. Uh, however, no further damage can be identified during that period. And indeed, uh, no open source uh, information, uh, images or videos posted uh, to social media indicated that any event had, uh, of any significance had taken place there on this day. It's paragraph 33 of your report, and I apologise, the dates are between February and the 13th of May, so a week after this event. Yes. Uh, then finally, please, may I ask you about your paragraph 34 and the analysis and verification that you undertook as to whether video three might have been manipulated or in some other way edited in uh, other than just by turning it, so to speak, inversely, one part coming after the other. Mm -hmm. uh, can you help us with what you looked at and how you can uh, give that statement? Understood. Um, so this paragraph uh, refers to a comparison of the video that was posted online on Twitter um, versus the uh, video that I was presented with by Bellingcat. When Bellingcat downloaded uh, this video, uh, they ensured that a hash was produced in the video. Uh, this is a digital fingerprint, um, which uh, can be then compared against other hashes of the same video at a later time and date uh, to see if any changes have taken place. And if, if any changes have taken place within the video, then that hash, that fingerprint would change. Um, so, sorry, so, so, just to get this straight, so you're looking at the stage at which it was downloaded by Bellingcat and whether any changes after its download had taken place. That is correct. Um, I should have made that clearer in my statement, um, for which I apologize. Uh, to be clear, as videos and images like this are posted on Twitter and Facebook and some other, uh, some other services, such as social media, uh, the metadata and exif data is actually stripped uh, from them. Um, so therefore, the analysis that was carried out uh, for this, or in reference to paragraph 34, 
uh, was regarding the, the video presented to me by Bellingcat. Yes, I see. So, so does it come to this, that you can tell that there has been no manipulation of what is now online compared to what Bellingcat downloaded, but you can't say anything as to what happened prior to Bellingcat downloading? Uh, that is correct. Uh, with regards to the video, um, with regards to any kind of manipulation before the video was uploaded, um, the video was posted, I believe, something like 10 or 11 hours after the attack took place. Uh, looking at the key events within the video, uh, namely the, the casualties present on the floor, uh, the casualties and people who appear to be civilians um, on the north side of the road, very close to the office of the presidency, and the actual strike itself, uh, there is nothing uh, within uh, those particular uh, details or within the video itself to indicate that it has been manipulated anyway. Thank you. Mr. Palmer, would you wait there, please? Uh, just one thing, I, I meant to ask Ms. Higgins this, but I, maybe you can answer the question. When you got the video, uh, was it posted with the subtitles already added or was that done by Bellingcat or yourself? Uh, that was not carried out by myself, my lady. I'd have to refer you to um, Mr. Yes, Higgins. Well, it that. may be. Yeah, all right. Uh, yes, I'm for Ms. Kelly. Uh, do you know what the answer to that is, um, Ms. Malcolm? Uh, I have you? assumed that those have been put on by Bellingcat, but I will make inquiries. You can make inquiries. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Cayley. Thank you, uh, my lady. Um, Mr. Palmer, we only have actually half an hour. Um, to do this. So if we can move relatively quickly, I won't cut you off, but mm -hmm. we were very late in the day. Um, so you understand as an expert that your duty is to the court and not to the party that is instructing you. Indeed, yes. And you would make the claim, and I think you've made it already, that you are an independent witness giving objective opinions. Is that right? That is correct, yes. And you would say those opinions are unbiased? Uh, I have a different interpretation of bias. Um, from my experience with uh, analysis and intelligence analysis, uh, bias is something that can be identified and mitigated, but it cannot be eliminated. Completely. Yeah, we'll come to that. Th thank you. Yeah. And you understand you have a duty to disclose to the court all the material that you relied on to produce your report. Yes. And, and you've done that, haven't you, in, in paragraph one? I think of your report, we don't need to bring it up. Um, you, you've already said this, you've relied upon um, video three, which is exhibit CG2, other pictures and satellite imagery, and I think two further videos posted online, that's video one, CG5 and CG6, that's it, right? Uh, as well as other content that was identified uh, while uh, conducting this research. Uh, yes. Sorry, so I other relevant. Other Sorry, other material. What was the other material that you said you relied on? Uh, so there were other videos as well that were viewed that provide contextual information related to this event, um, but were not necessarily included within this particular report. Okay. Can you tell us what videos those were? Uh, uh, I don't believe I can. They're not included within uh, this particular report. Um, I believe they are referred to further on. <coughs> Allow me just to search. Uh, there is also, yes, uh, video five, um, which shows the front of a particular building for which it was necessary to uh, see for or to conduct the geolocation to establish where this video took place. Okay. Now, you also understand that you're obliged to disclose any material which would actually undermine the reliability or credibility of your report. Yes. And, and you've done that, yeah. So, I mean, any material that there was. You, you've disclosed that, or well, there was none, essentially. Yes. Now, would you accept that if the evidential material or part of it on which you relied to produce your report was flawed, your report would be flawed as well, wouldn't it? Uh, potentially, yes. Um, now, let's have a look specifically at video three because we've got such limited time. Um, and have you got your report in front of you? I do, yes. Okay. Now, did 
I, and, I, and I'm not clear about this myself. Did you discover video three or was that discovered by Charlotte Goddard at Bellingcat and then you did the analysis later? So did you discover it or did Charlotte Goddard discover it? Uh, that was discovered by Charlotte Goddard. Right, okay, that's good that that's clear. And, and you know that she searched on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube, yeah? Yes, correct. And those are all social media sites, aren't they? Yes, correct. And you know that she entered the search Office of the Presidency SANA to find the relevant video material, don't you? Yes, correct. Now, I want to talk to you very briefly about algorithms, and I hope you understand them better than me, mm -hmm. as they're related to search engines. So if you can confirm what I'm going to say, simply put, an algorithm is a set of instructions that a computer follows when it's instructed to do something. Is, is that right? Uh, yes, it's a very simple level, correct. Yeah, I mean, remembering that we've got lay people watching this. Mm -hmm. And the judge doesn't and understand the, them either. Well, my lady, I would never, I would never um, in any way question your knowledge of these things. I'm sure it's much better than mine. Um, um, our algorithms are built into search engines, aren't they, Mr. Palmer? They are, yes. And they control, those algorithms can control and influence what a search engine uncovers when a search is input into that engine. That's right, isn't it? Uh, that is correct. However, I would emphasize that uh, open source investigators carry out measures in order to mitigate that. Yeah, okay, we'll to... come to that. We'll come to that, I, I'm, yeah. I'm aware. So, I mean, those algorithms, they are influenced by factors outside the search's control, aren't they? And we'll come to mitigating factors. That's right, isn't it? Uh, yes, you, you could argue that, yes. Yeah. Are you, are you following this, Milady? Do you? Yeah, I'm with you so far, Mr. Cayley. <laughs> um, and, and those sort of factors that could affect the algorithm and thus the results of the search could be, for example, the number of views that a site has already had, yes? Uh, yes, correct. Um, it could also be, say, the number of viewers on a particular Twitter account. So if there was a large volume of viewers that could affect the algorithm when somebody does a search on a particular matter it could prefer that site because so many people have looked at it that's right isn't it correct um another factor could be the time of day that an item was posted that could <coughs> the search result couldn't it uh i do not have uh i don't think anyone apart from google or twitter for example have access to a full understanding even within google or twitter have a full understanding of what the algorithms do and do not take into account but, so i believe it to be the case however i cannot yeah, but we. I'm we, sorry, sorry. Uh, just a moment, Kay. You say it could affect um, the number of users, or the number of viewers could affect the algorithm. In what way are you suggesting that it does something different? Are you, are you asking me, Milady? Or yeah, well, I'm. Well, actually, I suppose you, but I suppose I ought to ask. Um, Mr. Yeah, Mark. I think you, you should ask him. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in what way? Could, well, because you agreed with that. What mm -hmm. way could it affect it? So if you take the example of Google, um, Google makes it uh, or has a reputation because it shows people uh, results that are most relevant or that Google assesses are most relevant to a person. Yeah. Uh, so Google will collect huge amounts of data on individuals. Yeah. Um, and then when, say, for example, I search a particular subject or about a particular subject, Google will then show that person uh, what they, it believes to be the most relevant material for that person. So I see. So, in other words, if 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 somebody is in the habit of searching uh, for airstrikes, uh, Google will recognise it and immediately throw up a load of airstrikes. Uh, or what's that effect? <laughs> I wouldn't be sure if it'd go down to that kind of specificity, but certainly in terms of if a person's interested in a particular conflict, uh, then Google may identify that. Okay. Now. Mr. Palmer, to be fair about this, the Barclay Protocol does, in fact, give guidance on ways of mitigating the risk of bias in searches caused by algorithms, doesn't it? Uh, the Berkeley Protocol does, yes. Now, we don't have the time to go into it. If we had more time, I would. But the fact is, you cannot, even with these mitigating factors, you cannot completely eliminate the effect of algorithms in the searches that you make, can you? No, indeed. And I'd say I didn't, I would not want to because they help to discover these kind of, or this kind of content. 
But it's a fact, isn't it, that an algorithm doesn't allow you to produce a completely neutral search on the internet, does it? That's what algorithms do. Yes, I'd agree with that, yes. Um, now, video three, um, which came from the Twitter social media site, you received that from Bellingcat. Correct. And that video is not the original of the video, is it? It's not the very first version of the video, is it? Correct. And the fact is we simply don't know what version of the original video, video three is, do we? Uh, no. Uh, with this kind of content, what tends to happen is that a person will take a video uh, or an image, they will upload it, they may email it to their friends, sorry, or send it to their friends via WhatsApp or Signal in those groups. And then either the original person or somebody else may end up then posting that content online. So, so that is correct. So to be fair about this, um, it, it, it could be the first version up on Twitter, the second, the 10th, the 20th, or indeed even the 100th version, if it's sort of flying around social media, like you say. Uh, due to the quality, I wouldn't go quite as high as uh, 100, but yes, uh, it could have been uploaded in other places uh, via other many means. Many times, essentially. Potentially, yes. And, and we don't know, do we, who was the creator of the first video? So who actually made that film on their device, do we? Correct. We do not know that. And moreover, we don't know the identity of the person who uploaded the video onto Twitter or the social media sites, do we? Uh, the person who uploaded it is a Yemeni journalist uh, who's relatively well known. Um, so his identity is known. Okay, but for the purposes of this exercise, we don't know his identity, right? I would have to refer to Glan for okay. that. All right, don't worry, let's, let's move on anyway. Okay. Um, now, I want you actually to consider now some hypothetical factors about the upload. I mean, obviously I don't know who it is, so you know, I'm not in the same position as you, but theoretically, if an uploader on a social media site was only to tweet about said Saudi airstrikes and not who to attacks, you'd record that, wouldn't you, in, in your notes of doing your investigation as a possible bias, yeah? Yeah, so we would assign uh, usually informally a, a set of bias, well, not a set of bias, I beg your pardon. Uh, you know, I'd associate a particular account with uploading a certain type of content, yes. Yeah, and so if the upload often retweeted exaggerated claims about casualties, you'd record that, wouldn't you? Uh, yes, I would. That is a detail that I would pay attention to, correct. And, uh, and again, if, if the tweeter had tweeted unreli unreliable things in the past, you'd make a record of that too, wouldn't you? I, I wouldn't necessarily make a record of it. However, I would note that uh, perhaps uh, some of their social media posts have not been accurate. And, and, and those sort of factors that I've, I've said, you know, exaggerated claims, only reporting on what one side is doing, tweeting unreliable things, they could actually undermine your report, couldn't they, if they were true about uh, the uploader? In, in the case of this video, that's why we've carried out the active geolocation and chronolocation or to show that or demonstrate that this video does in fact show that event. Um, so it does to a certain extent when it comes to, say, for example, claims from that account, but not necessarily the content such as a video such as this, which can be verified. But, it's 17 hours. But again, not knowing who the first person was that recorded this video, so the person that actually recorded it on their device, we simply don't know, do we, whether they had any of those particular qualities, that they were biased towards one side, they you know, they tweeted exaggerated claims, they'd, they'd uploaded unreliable things, but we just don't know that, do we, about the person who made this video? Indeed, but the extent to which that affects the content of the video, I don't believe is actually uh, that that high um, because the content of the video itself can be, as I already mentioned, verified. But it's quite possible that the person that originally filmed this may have left out things that could be helpful to the defence because we just don't know, do we? Uh, yes, the video only shows partial. Uh, I recognise that the video only shows a partial uh, depiction of the scene. You know, for example, there's a wall there which separates the camera person from the office of the presidency. Uh, however, um, I do believe that does show a uh, genuine and, and credible uh, account of that incident, even if it is only a small part of it. But, it. but again, to repeat the question specifically about the person who originally recorded this, th these events, we, we simply don't know, do we, whether that person had any of these biases? I'm sorry, I, I don't fully understand the question. So, uh, are so you... 
you don't know who the person was, do you, who recorded this? The, the person who originally recorded it, do you? No, that's correct. So you have no idea what biases were in the mind of that person. Not, neither do I, by the way. Uh, no, that's true. Yeah, okay. Um, and we actually have no idea whether the person who originally recorded the video is a Houthi supporter either, do we? I mean, you don't know that and I don't know that. Uh, I do not. However, I would say uh, that even if they were, uh, the content uh, of their video, as I already mentioned, uh, because the process of verification, uh, I would still believe that video to be relevant for these proceedings. OK, let's talk about another technical issue. Um, so metadata and EXIF data. Mm -hmm. Now, again, keeping it simple, met metadata is data that gives information about other data, doesn't it, essentially? Yes, correct. And an EXIF, exchangeable image file, that's a form of metadata that gives technical information about images, right? Yes, correct. Um, so the metadata from the original version, from the very first video, would potentially give us the author, the creator, call him the author, call him the creator, and the date and time that the video was created. Is that right? Potentially, yes. And also it might give if this video had been modified, it would give us the date and time of that modification, if that had taken place, hypothetically, yeah? Yes, correct. Now, I think you've already said this in your examination in chief, but you said that when video material is uploaded onto social media, it's actually stripped of its metadata. That's correct, yes. So we, we don't have the original metadata here, do we? Uh, no, we do not. However, parts of it or aspects of that metadata or rather the data that the metadata contains uh, can be reconstructed by the active geolocation and uh, current location, although not all. Not, but not the author, right? No, not necessarily the author, no. Um, although the metadata or whether the metadata actually shows the author or not is uh, depends upon whether the person has actually made alterations to their phone to stamp, say, for example, an image. But, with their, but often their metadata on phones does contain, doesn't it, the author of the video? I mean, yes. So, okay, let's turn to your statement now, mm -hmm. at paragraph 34. Have you got that? Yes. Have you got that, my lady, in front of you? Yes, I have, thank you. Um, so, for the avoidance of doubt, I confirm that in conducting my analysis, I examined the file for indicators of manipulation. For example, examining the metadata and EXIF data, which retains a record of an electronic files generation, dissemination or alteration and found no such indicators to suggest that the video has been manipulated. Now, you've already made it clear that there you're actually referring to the version that Bellingcat uploaded. So there's no suggestion that Bellingcat's manipulated this video, right? Correct, yes. Um, but again, this is not the metadata attaching to the first version of the video, is it? That's correct, yes. Okay, this, in fact, the metadata that you have, um, or that, that Bellingcat has, is the metadata, whatever it was, attaching to the version that was uploaded on Twitter, right? Yes, that is correct. And again, that Twitter metadata would not tell you, would it, whether the video had been changed or manipulated prior to the upload on Twitter, because that metadata has been stripped, right? Correct, yes. Okay. What I want to do now, we've only got about five minutes left, but can you just look at paragraph 12 of your report? May I just add a further point to the previous question? Yeah, of course. You um, I would add that uh, EXIF data and metadata are, are part, one part of the verification process um, and are in fact not uh, absolutely reliable. Um, I've worked multiple times with images or videos uh, where the metadata states has been taken at one time um, and then by uh, the act of current location or geolocation, I've shown it to be otherwise. Um, indeed, I, I would argue that certain aspects of, say, for example, current location and geolocation are more uh, verifiable than metadata itself, um, as well as the fact that within the video, uh, there is no particular indication that has been manipulated. Um, certainly, I think that is an extremely unlikely proposition within the 11 or so hours between when this incident took place and when the video was uploaded.
I mean, as you say... Hi, Mr. Cayley. Yes. Uh, what would be an indication that the video had been manipulated? Yeah. Um, so, uh, to give you an example, um, in the Beirut explosion that took place uh, a few months ago, uh, there were hundreds of videos showing the, the explosion. Uh, none of them showed any kind of uh, missile or uh, munition impacting on the warehouse. However, some hours after all these initial videos were uploaded, uh, two particular videos were uploaded where someone had added a filter over the video and then, sorry, I beg your pardon, I'm going very fast. No, had, right, good. Yeah, had, yeah. had added a filter over the video and then added a, was actually a cartoon missile uh, within two frames. However, when the video was played at normal speed, uh, what you appeared to see within the video was a munition impacting uh, that warehouse. Um, by slowing that video down, you can examine frame by frame and quite clearly see a cartoon missile that's been added into the video, as well as the fact that someone has added on a filter, which was quite a clear attempt to try and make the, the video look different uh, from the original video, which had been filmed and which had been taken uh, and then repurposed for, the, for this fake. Um, but that, that, that's a fairly, obviously, amateur attempt, wasn't it, if it could be yes. straight away. But is it possible to make more sophisticated um, manipulations of these images? Not in the time period uh, that is present between this incident taking place and then this video being uploaded, no. Right. So it's, it's the timing between the incident as established and it being uploaded. That for me would be the primary factor. Uh, however, nothing else within the video stands out as indicating any kind of manipulation. Um, the uh, most important aspects of the video, the casualty in the rubble, uh, the casualty then being carried away, uh, the uh, casualties on the north side of the road and the strike itself, um, there's nothing about them that appears um, inconsistent uh, with uh, those kind of incidents or those kind of events. Um, and also I believe one of the other videos uh, which I'd have to search through my statement for, also shows that the same casualty that we see in the video lying on the road uh, actually being carried away from the scene. Um, so that was certainly filmed by a separate person, yet it shows the same casualty. Um, so primarily, uh, my confidence that this video has not been manipulated based firstly on the fact that it was uploaded only a few hours after the attack, and secondly, that uh, nothing within the video is inconsistent uh, with what I expect the aftermath of an airstrike to, to look like, or indeed uh, a secondary airstrike itself. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Kelly, I know I interrupted, but it's obviously no, quite... it's, it's fine, my lady. It's fine. Thank you. Um, so have you got your report in front of you? Can you go to paragraph 12? I can't, yes. And let me just read it because we're running out of time. Um, for mm. observation, it's possible to identify that segment one was filmed after segment two. And, and as you just referred to the casualty that's seen being pulled from the rubble and carried away in segment one appears to be the same casualty visible in the same place with debris, debris covering him in segment two. Now, can we just go to paragraph 15 of your report? Yes. And you say that it's not clear why these two segments are in this order, right? Correct. Um, now, are there two possibilities here? The first is that these are two completely separate videos that are stitched together, yeah? Correct, yes, that's a possibility. And the second possibility is that it's actually one video and the order's been reversed. Uh, that is a possibility as well, yes. Okay. Um, but you don't know, do you, which of those is the correct one? I mean, nor does anybody. No. I don't think that'd be possible to establish without speaking to the person who created the video. Yeah, but it, but it does mean that the video, it's possible that a single video has been altered, right? Uh, yes, that is possible. Um, I would, however, um, suggest, or I wouldn't describe it as being altered. Uh, sorry, no, that's a bad phrasing. I would note uh, that nothing of substance, or there still exists. I beg your pardon, sorry, I apologize, my lady. Um, Yes, is the answer to your question. So, when you say it is possible, you agree, with Mr. Cayley, it's possible that it's one video and the order is reversed. Yeah. But that means that somebody has manipulated the video. Yeah. Altered it. However, with regards to manipulation, I would consider that uh, 
adding, uh, say, particular details or potentially cutting out uh, potentially substantive details about the event itself. But I'm sorry, why would, if it's, if it's, let's say it's one person who's filmed this and he's uploading the video onto Twitter, mm -hmm. why would the order be reversed? Um, I wouldn't know. Um, I wouldn't know why a person would uh, do that. Um, as I said uh, before, or as I mentioned previously, um, a lot of this kind of content, these images, these videos are filmed and then posted within private WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups and then posted online by somebody else. Um, so sometimes they, uh, or we discovered these videos with relatively poor uh, quality or in relatively poor quality. Um, and sometimes, for example, they, they come to us like this with, say, for example, uh, two parts of what may be the same video. Um, so I would not be able to uh, say why someone would wish to uh, cut uh, this video in the way it has been. No, no well, I, I think my question was bad. Um, somebody, who, whoever uploaded it, therefore, did something to the video to upload it in reverse, in reverse order of the, of the incidents. Yeah, so you've got obviously footage from, or two separate segments of footage here. Uh, so yes, they have been edited um, to either add them together or you've taken a single piece of film and you have, uh, someone has cut it uh, yeah. and they've been bundled together again. <coughs> yes. So, I mean, here you, you accept that that video has been edited. You just use that word, yeah? Uh, yes, I would accept that. Um, when I wrote this report, um, my or the definition that I would consider manipulation uh, would be the manipulation of the footage that is present uh, within that video. Um, so yes, I'd accept that it's been edited, correct. Okay, let's look now because we're running out of time, your military background. You did three years as a regular infantry officer with two rifles, yeah? Correct. Uh, and I think you did um, an operational deployment to Afghanistan. That's correct, yes. Um, and you did four years as a reservist officer, yeah? That's correct, yes. And, and you retired as a junior officer as a captain, yeah? Uh, yes. And, and you've already explained that you're a small arms expert and a class three combat engineer, yeah? Uh, yes, I w yes. Uh, so I have the uh, small arms uh, or the qualification to, to run uh, all kinds of small arms range, uh, of, although obviously has lapsed now, but yes. No, 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 I'm understood. So, so you, you've got extensive experience on the application effects of small arms, haven't you? Yes, I would say I have. Now, would you accept that air launch munition, so bombs and missiles launched from aircraft, is a specialist military area? Uh, I would accept that, yes. Okay, actually, in the public Bellingcat report, which I know, you know, from background information you are familiar with, um, that report refers to a Yemen project munitions expert. So is there somebody on your team who is an expert in air launch munitions? Uh, on my team for uh, Ozzet reports, there is not, no. Okay. Um, but there is within Bellingcat people with that kind of expertise? Uh, I believe uh, from what I've been told uh, that that expert was not part of Bellingcat, but part of a wider network of people who were brought together for that uh, particular event. But, but you don't have any expertise on, on, in that area of air launch munitions, do you, in terms of your background in the Army? Of air launch munitions, uh, not from the Army. Um, as I said, or as mentioned in terms of my experience, I have been uh, examining these kind of uh, events uh, digitally uh, since 2016. Um, and I do have uh, experience in terms of what explosives or, you know, what explosives do or are capable of. Um, so some knowledge that is, I would argue, uh, useful to this matter, but not specifically in terms of my military experience with air launch munitions. Okay, thank you. Um, can we now actually play the video? And what I want you to do mm -hmm. is each time you see a casualty, if you can, so somebody that is either dead um, or wounded, can you stop the video and identify that person? Because I want to count um, the number of casualties uh, in this video. And obviously don't double count the same people because we do, as I mean, as you've already explained, we see the same person. Understood. So clearly uh, this gentleman here, uh, who potentially may be a child. So that's one. Mm -hmm. 
حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل لا اله الا الله محمد رسول الله يا رب So I wish to pause at this point just yeah. to explain that I believe is the same casualty. Okay. So that's one. Sorry, I know. I beg your pardon. That's the second casualty. Sorry, okay. I beg your pardon. Okay. The first casualty is still so two. <laughs> Correct. Yes. Allah intakum kum. Allah intakum minum. Why no? Why no? So here is the first casualty again. Um, I would also emphasize that when, if we could pause the video, uh, that when conducting this kind of analysis, I would go through frame by frame to identify. Yeah. No, I realize you've done that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> Uh, if you pause the video, the man who's potentially walking past may have been a casualty. Again, I'd wish to check the video again frame by frame. Um, okay. but I suspect so that, that may or may not be a casualty, that man that just walked past. So question correct. mark three, okay. Yes, correct. <coughs> Stop the video. Now, you've got a still image of that in your report, haven't you? Yes. Um, it's a still panoramic. So yeah. it is a combination of different stills that have been stitched together. Yeah. Um, but yes. Now, you, it's actually <clears throat> quite difficult to work <clears throat> out who the casualties are and who the helpers there are, isn't it? Uh, they may be a combination. It may be yeah. indeed both. There may be casualties. Yeah, what, what, would you, what would you say would be a fair estimate of the number of casualties if indeed there are helpers there too? From uh, the image you've got in your report. So there are certainly uh, that one gentleman lying on the floor, uh, the one gentleman being uh, carried away. Yeah. Uh, within the final few frames of the video, I believe, uh, again, I think it is something, or uh, judging from the video, I'd have to watch again frame by frame, uh, but it's something like four or five people um, who are uh, being helped, and then the people who are helping them also look particularly disheveled with uh, clothing hanging off them, which may indicate that they have also received the effects of the blast as well. So you, you reckon four casualties along? Uh, no, four plus two plus potential others. Um, so I would say at least six, possibly more. Okay. Six. So six from the video. Okay. Mm. Right. Um, just generally speaking, um, casualty figures from the media can be notoriously unreliable, can't they? I mean, we're now I'm not talking about the video, so what the press report, um, they can wildly differ, can't they? Uh, indeed. Uh, after events like this is incredibly confusing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no criticism. <laughs> so on this video, we can count possibly six casualties, right? I would say six, possibly more. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, let's just briefly, I'm, I've got to finish now because we've, we've run over a lot. Um, you used um, Wikimapia, yeah? That's a crowdsource mapping platform, yeah? Yes, correct. Along with another piece of software, what was it called? Uh, I believe it was OpenStreetMaps as well. 
Okay, okay. Now, in terms of using, doing the shadow analysis, using Wikimapia and open source maps, you teach this, don't you, to international organizations and police, how to, do, how to use these techniques for geolocation, chronolocation, right? That's correct, yes. And did you first learn these techniques at Bellingcat? Uh, no, actually, I was first introduced to these techniques while, actually, I'd argue I was first introduced to these techniques while in the army. Um, so oh, okay. geolocation is effectively map reading, but in reverse. Yeah. Uh, I mean, sorry to interrupt you, it's just we're running out of time. I mean, the, these techniques, they're relatively straightforward, aren't they, actually? Uh, I believe so, yes, although I understand that can... Uh, may not be apparent to some people, but yes. Yeah, I mean, you could teach me how to do this, couldn't you, in a relatively brief period of time? Uh, you have my email, you could get in touch. But no, seriously, I mean... Yes, absolutely. Most people of, of sort of average intelligence how to do this in a few hours, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Uh, and thank you very much. I'll, I'll close there, my lady, because I think we're well over time now, so thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Yes, there was one recommendation. Palmer, I'll be very brief. <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's being suggested that this is somehow less serious because there are fewer casualties, but are you aware of the evidence of the doctor that he treated 13 people, three of whom died? I beg your pardon, was that a question for me? Yes. Uh, no, I'm not familiar with that evidence. Are you, have you seen the photographic evidence of other casualties, including one underneath a car? Uh, I have seen other videos which show other uh, casualties which are referred to within the, the report. Um, uh, I cannot recall that uh, casualty explicitly. Um, I would have to look through my report and look through the uh, other content that is there, uh, but I can't recall that. All right. Um, may I take you back to algorithms? <clears throat> An algorithm may obviously affect the type <clears throat> of material thrown up by a search, but is there anything in your experience that suggests that an algorithm affects the content of a particular video once it's been thrown up? Uh, no, there is no, uh, the search engine uh, shows you uh, a result. It will not um, edit or change that result or the in what is inside that result, I beg your pardon. Sorry, I, did I make that clear? No, uh, okay. Um, so no, Google as a search engine may show me a link to say a Twitter uh, page. However, it will not alter anything within that Twitter page. Right. Or that video, yeah. Um, you talked about both manipulation and editing. Yes. Clearly this video has been edited. Yes. In that it has been put up inversely. Has it been manipulated in your opinion? And how is that different? No, I don't believe it has. Um, so uh, I should have perhaps included that kind of definition within the statement. However, for me, editing would be uh, chopping and changing a video, uh, as you've seen with this particular video, you know, putting two bits in different order. Uh, for me, manipulation uh, indicates a malicious intent in order to show something or, or change a particular aspect of that scene. Um, usually done by, for example, uh, a CGI edition of a cartoon missile. Um, so for me, I think there is a, a qualitative difference between the editing that can be carried out in videos like this and then also manipulation of these videos. Uh, and the final question, please, um, in relation to bias, let's assume for the moment that whoever posted this video to Twitter uh, is biased against the Saudi-led coalition and or biased in favour of Houthi. Uh, or, or even had previously exaggerated uh, casualties, civilian casualties in earlier tweets. Does any of that in your view make the photographs of the dead and injured civilians in this particular video less likely to be an accurate depiction of the events of the morning of the 7th of May? Uh, no, it does not. Uh, it would, in my opinion, not make it less likely to be a, a genuine representation of what happened. Thank you very much. I have no other questions. Does your leadership have any questions for Mr. Palmer? Uh, yeah, just a, 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 just a comment. It really relates to your expertise. I mean, you, you were asked about being an expert. Your expertise is in what exactly? You, I, I don't think you're claiming that you have the expertise to um, 
diagnose whether a, a, a piece of film would have has been manipulated if it's sophisticated. Is that right? Um, so I would emphasize that I'm not a digital forensic expert, yes. um, which is looking at, uh, say, for example, the manipulation of image or, uh, yeah, so say the manipulation of the metadata of an image or the image itself. Um, so yes, I want to make that plain. Um, yeah, I should leave it at that, yeah. Well, no, but I mean, so you, your expertise, which comes from your training and your work um, uh, as a cyber threat intelligence analyst and so on and so forth, is in identifying, or no, sorry, verifying whether or not what appears on a piece of film, as in this case, mm -hmm. is genuine. Yes, I would say so. Yeah. And that expertise comes from what? You, your work as a cyber threat intelligence analyst together with your army. Uh, so it comes from the range of experience over the last few years um, uh, within the army, within the, the module that I completed at King's College London, um, f working as a cyber threat intelligence analyst, as well as working for Osmond Reports itself. Um, yes, I don't understand. I'm, I'm not quite clear that your master's degree has much to do with anything. Uh, well, the module the module which focused on the use of open source uh, certainly did. Right. Okay. And how long did that module last? Matter uh, so that was a half year module. Okay. Yeah, and you've already explained why you, in your view, this is a genuine. Um, and I'm sorry, just one other question: Why would you use um, Wiki? Uh, I'm sorry, just get away. Wikimapia, my lady. Wikimapia, which uh, I have to say I spend my life telling jurors that the most um, obvious example of inaccurate information is Wikipedia. Why would you use Wikimapia as opposed to Google Earth? Uh, I, would, I would happen to disagree with you on that, but that's not the question. Um, the, uh, within Google Maps and Google Earth, uh, that location is not listed uh, as any potential uh, or does not have any information connected to it. I see. Um, Wikimapia um, and OpenStreetMaps are unique in that the information there is added by its users. Yes, um, I know. Well, well that's yes. the problem, isn't it? Uh, well, not necessarily, because the reason why they are they're used and it, and it works is because the vast majority of the information on there is actually relatively accurate. It's why they are useful tools and why people do use them. Um, mm -hmm. I, I suspect in, in this case, if someone had uh, for example, gone on Wikimapia and added that information either, you know, the day of the strike or a couple of days before, I would be uh, suspicious of it. Um, you know, why has that been added that time? However, in this case, that information had been added, I believe, something like eight or nine years ago, um, associating it with the Office of the Presidency. Um, and as such, I believe it's a, a valid and useful data point. Um, yes. Although it, I do agree that uh, that is a piece of information which uh, would require, I think, further verification, if at all possible. Yes, no, well, I, I don't think there's, there's any real dispute about that. But mm. I, uh, Yes, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Palmer. Thank you very much, lady. Yeah. Lady, thank you. That completes the evidence, uh, save that I promised I'd come back to you about the subtitles. They oh, yes. were put on uh, by the investigators. They were not, therefore, on the video at the time that it was uploaded to Twitter. Right. So, my lady, I'd hand over to uh, Mr. Cayley now to make his submissions. Yes. Yes, Mr. Cayley. Um, I've read your very helpful skeleton argument. Thank you very much. Um, the, um, the longer version. I think, it, I think you produced a shorter version, which perhaps yes. could push up while you make your yes. submissions. I, can we try and narrow it? Yes, so that everybody can see it. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, my lady. Uh, I will be brief because you do have the... I do, yes. And, if you can just have highlight... But I'll, I'll highlight some points for the purpose yeah. of the people that are watching. We say that both the um, video CG2, so video three, and the expert report of Mr. Palmer should be excluded from evidence. The law 
uh, we rely on is fairly clear. It's set out in detail in my skeleton argument. We rely on both English domestic law and also the law of the International Criminal Court and the ad hoc tribunals. The ICC, we know, is currently grappling with these issues. Now, dealing with the video first, if the video is not reliable or authentic, and, and we say it's not uh, for the reasons that we've stated, then there is really a very uh, faulty, uh, fragile basis for the expert report. Now, dealing first of all with the subtitles, what my learned friend has just been referring to, and the, the, um, the soundtrack, so the comments made by people um, who appear on the video. We, we say that, 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 that those statements, they are inadmissible. I mean- I, I, don't, I don't think you need trouble about- uh, All right, the, thank you, my lady. Then I, I, will, I will move on um, if that is the case. Yeah. Um, as to the video, itself we we have established i think even through the witnesses that, that that there is actually unavoidable bias in these searches yes you can take uh, mitigating action to reduce it but the fact is these algorithms do determine the results of searches and there aren't sufficient steps that you can take to eliminate that altogether um, there's no way really of knowing what's been prioritized or missed, um, there could be exculpatory evidence that has been simply missed because of the nature of these searches. And you heard, I think earlier, uh, Mr. Higgins say that it's entirely possible um, that the original video was uploaded by somebody with an interest and an agenda. Um, so it could have been uploaded by somebody that had uh, relations with the Houthi. Um, we know that the video that's uploaded on Twitter is not the original video. That's been acknowledged. We have no idea who created that video. I know that Mr. Palmer has constantly referred back to the content to say that it's authentic. But in the end, nobody knows who created the original video. And the best possible outcome would be for the prosecution to call the person who made that video and they cannot do that. This is an extracted version of the original video. Um, it's been uploaded on social media. As Mr. Palmer conceded to me, that version, the version that was uploaded on Twitter could be one of many tens, all right? He didn't accept from me, it could be up to a hundred different versions, but certainly he accepted there could be many permutations of this video floating around on the social mediator. So video three, again, we, 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 we disagreed over terminology, but he certainly accepted that that video has been edited. Um, he didn't like the word manipulation. Um, it's been accepted that it could be two videos stitched together or one video that's been reversed. Either way, the video has been edited or manipulated, whatever word you want to, you, you want to use before it was uploaded um, onto Twitter. And that I think is something about which we should be extremely cautious. So the position of the defense in respect of all of these aspects, and certainly I don't think Mr. Palmer and Mr. Higgins together have allayed um, these sort of underlying uh, lack of this lack of certainty, the, these underlying issues that tend to suggest that this evidence could be reliable. I don't think either one of those witnesses um, has dealt with those issues sufficiently to make this video reliable. And our, and our position is it should be excluded under Section 78 of PACE because it's simply not reliable and it's prejudicial and it shouldn't be admitted. Now, briefly, um, the matters that you raised yourself, lady, um, at the end of Mr. Palmer's evidence on, on whether or not he is an, an expert. And well, I don't- I to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, I, I don't say this with any lack of respect. Mr. Palmer's clearly a very honorable man who has served his country, um, in particular in Afghanistan. Um, but, but I would refer you to the case of Rob um, in which I think 
the lady, you, you prosecuted that case. Uh, I was say, I'm very familiar with the case. And, and you prosecuted it very well too, my lady, I might say from what I've read. Uh, <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> um, but, but the Court of Appeal in that case um, did warn um, about tenuous qualifications of experts. And I know we've seen in the last 20 or 30 years, you know, the, the array of experts ha has expanded rapidly. Um, but, I, but I think in Rob, they, they make the point um, that it cannot be the case that effectively an expert of somewhat tenuous qualification actually shifts the burden of proof uh, imperceptibly on, on the defence to, as it, as it were, sort of prove our own case. And again, I'm not saying that Mr. Palmer is a quack or a charlatan, but you heard him say himself that he could actually teach me in a few hours um, how to do this. And I think there are limits um, to his, his expertise as you drew out for him. Um, video three, we say, is unreliable in and of itself. Um, he's not... Uh, a qualified expert in the traditional sense of the word. He's given his expert opinion based on flawed evidence. And, and we say, frankly, his expert opinion should not be admitted into evidence either because he frankly is not really an expert. He's, he's an individual that's been brought in by the prosecution to give this video some indicia of reliability and then to sort of push this video into evidence. He's not a traditional expert, as he himself acknowledged. He's not a forensic video technician. He's not an expert um, in, in the way videos are put together. That is the kind of individual that the prosecution should have called in a case like this. And as you know, we have not had the opportunity to call an expert. So, so my view is he is not an expert. He's not sufficiently qualified. Um, he's clearly an honourable man, an army officer, but the expert report should not be admitted um, for the reasons I've already stated. I won't repeat myself. Yes, no, I, I, I've got to point on that. Um, but um, going back to the question of whether yeah. Mr. Palmer it, it, it can be uh, regarded as an expert in this field, he says, through my training, through my army service, through the work I've been doing for the last few years, through the... Um, uh, the, the the course he did at um, university, uh, the, the module, and uh, he, he he could be said to be a, a, an expert, could he not? In not on whether technically there has been some kind of interference, let's put it that way, with the video, um, but whether or not. Uh, from the circumstances of what's shown on the video, the lack of any obvious signs, um, the uploading and the like, um, isn't he entitled to say, in my judgment, from my experience, um, this has not been, as you, to use his word, manipulated? Well, I think actually in your question, Milady, you've identified the problem that you said at the beginning, you know, he's not technically qualified to say whether there has been some kind of underlying you know, deep manipulation of this video, because that needs a technical expert to look at the, these videos frame by frame. Again, I, I emphasize, you know, we would have instructed our yes, own no, I expert, that. And, that, and that's, that puts me in a difficult position. But our position is that the level of technical expertise that you really do need to have to, to work out whether this video has been manipulated at some stage, he simply doesn't have. He's looking at the content and he's saying to you, yes, well, I've served in the army. I can tell you that the content that you can see is consistent with, with an airstrike. I mean, frankly, I think a jury can look at that. A jury can look and see whether the sky is clear. A jury can look and see who appears to be injured. A jury can look and see there's rubble everywhere. There's, there's, there's clearly been a second explosion or not. And I think many of the comments that, that he makes, frankly, it doesn't require an expert. It can be done by a finder of fact. Yes, not, not, you're not suggesting that um, geolocation and um, chronolocation can be done by 
uh, an ordinary member of the public. Well, he told me he could teach me in a couple of hours how to do it. I mean, it's hardly yeah. sort of brain surgery. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be flippant, but it, but it's not some form of technical expertise that requires years and years of training, a PhD, uh, any of that. This is a relatively straightforward uh, way of addressing it. Now, to be honest with you, and again, I'm, I'm gonna be careful what I say here. I mean, I've looked at this shadow, um, looking at shadows to tell the, the, the time. And of course, there, there, there is some um, plausibility in this, but actually the maths around it, when you, when you look at it in detail, is very, very complicated to do it comprehensively. And I, and I don't know enough. It's, you know, it's linked to sines and cosines. And again, I don't have an expert to, to look at this and say, well, actually, it's a bit more complex to do a really thorough job. So I'll, I'll finish there, unless you have any more questions. No, I don't. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Yes, you're welcome. welcome. Hello, lady. Well, Eddie, it's the submission of the prosecution that there are very good reasons, first of all, of policy to admit this evidence. Over the last 10 years, there's been an increasing acknowledgement of the importance of transnational and international criminal judicial processes, including as to the admissibility of evidence from foreign states in a manner and of a type not necessarily traditional in this country. I indeed, even the Trade and Cooperation Agreement signed just before Christmas uh, emphasizes uh, that the most serious crimes of concern to the international community must not go unpunished and their effective prosecution must be ensured at national level. Uh, and the reason that that's important is because the alternative is impunity. However, having started there, it is not just because the crimes alleged are so serious that the prosecution say this evidence is admissible. The, uh, the, the analysis would be equally applicable if we were dealing with theft of a milk bottle. And I make it clear, I'm not saying that the rules should be bent or changed in any way because the crime is such a particularly serious one. As a matter of law, the prosecution submit that this evidence is real evidence. It's not hearsay at all. As far as the two comments contained within the video are concerned, those are plainly raised gesti. Uh, one as to where it took place and the other as to the fact that it was Saudi aggression. However, whatever your ladyship uh, rules as to those, they're not in fact either of them in issue. There's, uh, there's really no dispute either as to the place this took place or as to the fact that in general, it was the coalition that was responsible. The question is whether or not Mr. al Qatani is in any way to blame. So that that, although as a matter of uh, strict technical law is admissible, doesn't really take my- uh, I don't think it's further. a major point, is it? Doesn't matter whether they're there or not. No. It, it, indeed, indeed, my lady. Uh, as far as evident, real evidence is concerned, its admissibility, I perhaps depart a little bit from the introduction that we heard earlier to this voir dire in that that sort of evidence is regularly admitted in the courts of this country. CCTV evidence, police body cam evidence, uh, online content as well, including tweets that are uploaded or posts that are uploaded that show street brawls in process or sometimes that show sexual offenses being committed. Uh, as part and parcel of that, somebody will upload a, a tweet and that evidence is relied upon in court. Uh, think also in the US of the footage that was uploaded in the case of the killing of George Floyd. Now, in general, but not always, the prosecution can identify the maker of that footage. As I say, however, not always. It is admissible at common law as evidence depicting the, uh, the, 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 the picture, the story that it shows providing only that it is sufficiently reliable and credible. So I accept that your ladyship will be looking at appropriate safeguards in relation to the inherent reliability, but of which provenance is only one aspect. Uh, every single means of recording an accusation through the ages has been capable of manipulation, whether it's a video uploaded to Twitter, a written statement given to a police officer, or a pictogram recorded in hieroglyphics in ancient Egypt. Uh, the courts are fully familiar with testing reliability in front of a jury. In other words, repeating very much this sort of exercise in front of the jury, uh, looking for corroboration, and in due course, uh, in giving juries suitable and appropriate warnings. 
The court should not, in my submission, set their face against this form of evidence simply because it's new. After all, your ladyship may be aware that when photographs were first made available, uh, the United States courts in the 19th century were reluctant to admit them as independent proof, an attitude that would now seem to us bizarre. Uh, I recognize that there is a difficulty in this case in that the maker or makers of the film are not capable of identification. But as a general thesis, the evidence is capable of far greater checks than other and earlier forms of evidence, or indeed sometimes ordinary uh, parole evidence is capable of. First, you have, in this case, corroboration by triangulation in terms of comparison with the other short clips on Twitter, with, which are within the papers, corroborating that an attack did happen, that it happened on that particular date, that it caused widespread damage, and that it happened at the time, uh, within a few minutes, that Mr. Palmer, the expert, says that it occurred according to his chronolocation calculations. Uh, secondly, you have the evidence of the doctor as to his treating of civilian casualties uh, who had plainly been the victims of this kind of airstrike. Thirdly, you have corroboration uh, by the chronolocation that I've referred to. Fourthly, as to geolocation, and you recall Mr. Palmer's evidence, he wasn't told in advance where this was said to have taken place. He identified it, and then it turned out that he was correct. And only fifthly, do you have the question of the metadata, uh, absent as I accept, uh, and therefore uh, the question of looking at internal consistency to see whether this video appears to have been manipulated or edited in a way other than the inversion from front to back. Uh, the Crown would submit that the video passes each of those checks. Yes, uh, yes. So you do, you, you do accept that, that that is the point, isn't it? And the point the defence made quite strongly um, that it, there has been editing, that's clear. Um, it, it, indeed, there has. And, and but, but uh, on that basis, doesn't that in itself uh, raise the question of whether there was other material in it, as Mr. Cayley puts it, uh, which may well have assisted the defence in this case? Well, my lady, there are two answers to that. First, the mere fact that two passages of video have been inverted does not affect whether the content of the passages you do have are accurate. And secondly, it's necessary to examine what Mr. Cayley means when he says that matters that might have been helpful have been edited. Exculpatory evidence, he said, might have been missed. Well, I think- And I ask, sorry. Sorry, I think he was referring to his client's uh, um, defense. Um, but this is not as uh, um, uh, as put to the police officers that this wasn't a civilian error at all. It was a wash with military. Um, well, uh, again, well, my lady. Yeah. Again, my lady. There are there are a number of answers to that. Uh, first of all, I asked rhetorically, what exactly that would be helpful to the defence is Mr. Cayley suggesting has been edited out. Uh, it, it's, it's a matter of that the court can take cognizance of that the center of uh, Sana'a is not the area that uh, Mr. al Qatani described in interview as somewhere way out in the country where there are no civilians. Uh, I mean, it's beyond logic to suggest that the commercial center of the city, which is identifiable from maps and from photographs, uh, mm -hmm. and indeed no doubt from the National Geographic and the Times Historical Atlas, is not going to be a, a, a a, um, an isolated area with no civilians. But secondly, the whole point of Mr. al Qatani's defense is that by the time this strike took place, he was back at his base, no doubt tucking into a well-earned breakfast uh, because he says that his um, mission was carried out at seven in the morning. Yeah. So it, again, I asked rhetorically, to what does this go in terms of the defense? What is it that would assist Mr. al Qatani? It's perfectly open to him, and no doubt we'll see it in due course, for him to deny his involvement in this allegation in toto by providing his flying logs, which I would uh, think that Mr. Cayley will suggest. Well, I think we're, getting, we're, getting, we're getting slightly off point there, but yes. Oh, all right, but your leadership has my point that 
yeah. it's necessary when asking whether it's going to be difficult for the defense to deny this or whether there is exculpatory material that would genuinely be useful to the defense to identify what the defense is and his defense is whatever happened at 10 30 it wasn't me yeah yeah and to that extent therefore uh the, the crown would say that what happened at 10 30 is is admissible because there is nothing that uh, Mr. Cayley can cross-examine to that assists his defendant that deprives the Crown from that evidence, of that evidence. Um, yes, I think I've got this point. Um, and I've got the rest of, obviously, the risk. Can I just ask you about um, uh, uh, Mr. Um, Palmer uh, yes. as an expert? Do you, do you say that he is an expert? Um, as required. Uh, my lady, I do, uh, that he is an expert in relation to what he gives evidence about. He's been very frank in, in saying that he, he, there is no metadata. So the very fact that he's unable to identify or to analyze the metadata is irrelevant because nobody would be able to. Yep. What he is able to do is give the court the benefit of his experience in relation to whether the uh, video looks as if it has in any way been manipulated, or it looks as if it is the genuine, as he described it, the genuine aftermath of an airstrike. Uh, and your leadership will be very familiar with the fact that police officers who have many years of experience in the drug squad uh, give evidence as to, for instance, the value of drugs or the uh, fact that what was found appeared to them to be cannabis as opposed to heroin. You don't need uh, a, a postgraduate degree in chemistry to make that identification if you've worked in the drug squad for 15 years. Uh, you can uh, give that sort of evidence to the court and Court of Appeal have held that you can by virtue of your experience. Yes. This is yeah, I know. Uh, in, in, in exactly the same way I would rely on that type of experience as far as Mr Palmer is concerned. And as far as, as you, you, you started off by saying that, that these days you get a lot of unattributable material being used in evidence. Do you say that um, the sort of gang rap um, videos that are often used in cases where there's um, alleged murders or um, as a result of gang rivalry, do you say this is it falls into the same category? It can do, lady. There are two sorts of gang uh, videos. The one which is a, a real-time depiction of the events going on, yeah. and that would be the exact equivalent here, of real, in, in other words, real evidence in the technical sense of that term. The other, which is where posts are put up that um, are annotated, uh, in, sometimes with writing, uh, that suggests that somebody is a member of a particular gang, have more problems attached to them. Because there well, I do accept. Yeah, I had more in mind that where, where a, a defendant is arguing that he's not a member of a gang and evidence is given of a rap video which has been uploaded onto YouTube or whatever, uh, which um, suggests that he is a member of a gang. I mean, again, without any provenance as to who uploaded it or how it's been produced. Yes, your, your ladyship may be thinking about the case of Bucknor yeah. Uh, where um, the Court of Appeal held that that evidence was inadmissible, yeah. principally because, uh, first of all, the, the statement that was being made was not a real-time depiction of a series of events. It was a statement made by others that a particular defendant was a member of the gang. And secondly, because given that it was hearsay, the learned judge in that case didn't go through the provisions in section 114 subsection 2 of the Criminal Justice Act in yes. order to mm -hmm. ensure that the safeguards have been complied with. Yeah, no, uh, right. I, I, that was the one, it was the one I was thinking suddenly, I suddenly remembered about that one. Yeah. Yes. Yes, all and, right. And, and in my submission, this is just a different type of case entirely. Yeah. Because yes. it's not hearsay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Um, we are, we've, I think we've well run over, but very quickly, Mr. Cayley, do you want to come back on, on anything that's been said? Um, my lady, I will come back um, briefly um, then in two points. Um, the first is this, um, Ms. Malcolm raised that the mere fact that two passages of the video and the segments have been um, spliced in, in 
um, different order does not affect the accuracy of it. And my lady already um, raised concerns about that. Um, we would counter it and say and go further that it's it is problematic and it does depict manipulation in this regard. Um, it calls into question the authenticity and reliability of it because we don't know at what stage it was edited and uploaded and using what programs and, um, and the specialities of doing so. And neither do any of these experts. I go further because we've all made the assumption that it's just the visual element that has been um, inaccurate. The prosecution have sought to rely on the audio element. If there has been editing and it's been uploaded, how can we be sure that- Yes, you need in trouble, as I've said to Mr. Cayley, um, uh, it, it, it is unlikely that I'm going to allow the, the, the audio. Element, I, I, I think that, that probably um, is but, um, great for um, that's um, why you I, need to but, but can you tell me mr Cayley said and miss malcolm's responded what do you say uh that was could have helped uh your client could have been edited out of the video uh, given his defense given his defense um um we have um well, uh, Miss Malcolm had phrased that. What can it not? Sh what may it not show? Well, yeah. well, but she says, what can it not show that could possibly assist what your defence is, namely that you weren't there at all at ten o'clock. Exactly. And if and as you've heard, the issue part of the issue is well, we say seven a.m. They say ten um, and or, on or around between ten thirty and ten fifty a.m. Well, if the video has been edited and part of it's been cut out, and for example. Um, my lady, it showed this um, moments before the strike or moments before the second strike, we may be able to identify, for example, if it was a drone, if it was a, another plane, um, if, for example, the second after wave in, depicted in that video didn't come from either a drone or a plane, but actually a secondary explosion near a building beside it. We just don't see that in the video. We also do not see my lady uh, the identification of um, that would attribute that would attribute it at that time that they say to the Saudi coalition because if the Saudi coalition or the um, the defendant is saying my particular mission was at seven a.m. and it's to do with me, not just anyone who did this attack at that particular time, the prosecution cannot properly attribute it to our client at that particular time because that video doesn't show that. It doesn't assist us in that regard in any shape or form. So when they ask, forgive me, my lady. Yeah. Sorry, my lady. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I, I'm sorry. I slightly lost you there. Could you just? Uh, we really are over time. Could you just very quickly say again? Yes, um, my lady. What um, I was saying is that where it could assist is that if what has been admitted, for example, is a depiction, for example, for the second strike of a plane or a drone flying over. If it was a plane, it may identify or attribute it to anyone, and it may not even be the um, um, the Saudi coalition, let alone the defendant's particular plane. Yeah, I see. So you're saying if 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 what was edited out was that all of this damage was caused by a drone, then 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 it's in, uh, your client's account of it being a completely different incident in a completely different place is going to be supported. Yes. It, it, the point is that because of that editing, we can't rule out um, yeah, the right. no, no, but, attribute, essentially. Yes. Right. Thank yes. You. Anything else? Um, I go no further. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. Um, well, um, thank you uh, to all council for their exceedingly um, helpful um, submissions and uh, the... Um, uh, the, the way in which the witnesses were dealt with. Um, as has already been said, this is a, a, a complicated matter, which I want to think about before I deliver a ruling. And so, um, as uh, the um, organizers have said, um, I will give my ruling on whichever day, it was Tuesday the 15th, I've forgotten. <laughs> Tuesday the 16th, my lady, at 4.45. Yeah, at uh, 4.45. Um, and I hope uh, that those who have um, followed this have found this of interest. 
Um, it is, I think, the first time that there's been um, any kind of submission uh, like this. So thank you all very much. Um, anything that needs to be said by anybody else? Otherwise, this hearing is uh, closed. Yes. Uh, uh, Yvonne, do you want to say anything further? No, just to thank everyone. It's it's great to see such a wonderful turnout and thank you council for this um, fantastic exercise. So we look forward to the judgment and we will send a link to register for that. It's a separate webinar that will happen in a couple of weeks. We'll send that to everyone who has registered for this event. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Yes, that concludes the hearing. <laughs>